could talk a little bit about the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene, and I hope by the time I'm finished I can convince you that this is a really remarkable resource that we have here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, what, uh, give you a little idea where I'm going, I'm going to give you a little history about the lab, a little of the organization, and then take you on a virtual tour so you can you can see or maybe realize the types of things that this laboratory does. And then I want to spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the contributions of the lab to public health and then go over sort of our research mission and highlight some of the areas that our laboratory uh, conducts research in. The School of Medicine uh, and now School of Medicine and Public Health and Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene were formed almost about the same time, 1903, 1904. Both of these organizations were uh, recognized and initial funding from the Wisconsin legislature. Both of us uh, uh, sort of had our beginnings back in the, the very early days of public health in the state, and both at the School of Medicine and Public Health and the State Lab of Hygiene we do a lot of things that I think exemplify the Wisconsin idea. For those of you who may be new to campus, and, and or, uh, you may not realize that here at Wisconsin, one of the things that we like to say is that the borders of the university do not reside just on campus, but that we really push what we do on campus out to the entire state. And the School of Medicine and the State Lab of Hygiene, I think, do an exemplary job of doing that. The state lab was specifically t attached to the university by the legislature back in 1903 to take advantage of the university's scientific capabilities, its research and teaching to promote public health. This was really quite unique because even though all states have a state public health lab, there are only three states, Wisconsin, Iowa, and now Nebraska, where the state public health lab is really attached to the university versus being incorporated into a Department of Health or some other executive agency. And during the time when budgets are tight and uh, we struggle like we seem to do today, it's much nicer to be part of the university than it is to be part of a state executive agency. 1903, the laboratory began with a whopping budget of $1,500. Uh, today, that would hardly buy a couple dozen test tubes. But the, the lab was formed, and the first laboratory here on campus was in a building. And if you look closely at the picture, you might be able to recognize that that's the building that is CALS over on Linden, not far from where our laboratory is located today. We actually had two small rooms in a closet in that building for a number of years until the laboratory moved up to uh, South Hall, which was, uh, if you're on Bascom Hill looking down State Street, the first building on the right is known as South Hall. And the laboratory was in the basement of that building for a number of years before it moved over to what, what used to be Old University Hospital. But when the laboratory was formed, in the statutes it basically said the laboratory shall provide complete laboratory services in some key areas that support public health. Water quality, air quality, public health, contagious diseases uh, to support not only agencies here in the state but to support uh, activities at the university. Uh, were specifically charged with being the lab for the Department of Health Services here in Wisconsin and also for the Department of Natural Resources. This means we have a clinical component to our laboratories and then we also have a fairly robust environmental testing component uh, as well. Uh, the lab, like I mentioned, is attached to the University of Wisconsin to make available to the UW system and to the state agencies facilities for teaching in the fields of public health and environmental protection. And what I'd like to do is just highlight some of those key areas that the lab uh, is involved in today. But before I do that, I want to go back to sort of 
uh, show you how the laboratory and the School of Medicine uh, have been linked together in the past. 1914, the Dean of the School of Medicine served as the director of the laboratory. And since that time, a number of uh, individuals who have been either chair of various departments or in other key leadership positions on campus have served as director of the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. Al Evans back in the late 50s. Many of you may, may know uh, Dr. Stan Inhorn, who was chair of the Department of Pathologies. Uh, and then uh, some of you may know Ron Lessig, uh, who was the pre my predecessor here at the laboratory, was also a professor in pathology and population health sciences. Today, the leadership of our lab includes myself, uh, Dr. Dan Curtis, sitting right here, is the medical director of the lab. And then Dr. Pete Schult is the director of the Communicable Disease Division and has a faculty appointment in med micro and immunology. We also have others in the disease prevention area that Dr. Curtis leads, uh, and their names are here. Uh, a few weeks ago, Dr. Jennifer Laffin presented on our cytogenetic capabilities at the lab. Uh, Dr. May Baker, I think, has talked to the group before about a real exciting project that I'll describe briefly a little later. And then uh, Dr. Greg Rice is our director of our biochemical genetics lab that is the most recent laboratory that we incorporated into our operation. On the environmental side, we're pleased to have a new director of our environmental health division, Dr. James Hurley, uh, who uh, has a faculty appointment in uh, civil and environmental engineering. In addition to that, Dr. Sharon Long has been with us about five years, and is, uh, her appointment is in CALS, and she's quite active in doing research in soil science and in developing tools that allow us to uh, uh, track down uh, uh, infectious sources of uh, outbreaks that are associated with the environment. And then two other uh, individuals, Dr. Jamie Schauer and Dr. Martin Schaefer, are also in the School of Engineering, and both of them have very robust research projects that uh, are supported by our laboratory, and I'll mention a couple of those a little later. But we're a little bit unique because uh, we actually uh, have a board that oversees the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. In statute, the governor appoints the members of the board, uh, and the people who are on the board include the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Madison, or their designee, and then the secretaries of the Department of Health Services, the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, uh, and the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, in addition to that, the governor appoints a, a physician to represent clinical labs, someone to represent environmental laboratories, uh, occupational health laboratories, local health departments, and then three other members, one of which uh, represents the coroners and medical examiners because of the work that we do for them throughout the state. If you were to ask me what it is or what is the scope of the state lab of hygiene, in four words, I can say it's testing, it's teaching, it's research, and it's uh, outreach. And I'll describe a little bit of, of that as, as we go forward. Uh, the State Lab of Hygiene supports a number of uh, clinical, environmental, and occupational health activities here in the state of Wisconsin. We certainly do uh, laboratory testing to support clinicians, hospitals, and clinics. Uh, we work closely with a number of state and federal agencies on projects, and as a result of that, we are able to bring in a fair amount of uh, resources in, in the form of grants and, and contracts. We uh, work with the local health departments because much of the laboratory work that they need to have is something that's sort of, it's not the type of uh, lab work that can be duplicated in 94 local health departments around the state of Wisconsin. And so we actually function as their laboratory under agreements with the Department of Health Services. We work with academic institutions, both here in Madison and elsewhere around the state. And many of our staff are very actively involved in professional 
and research associations statewide and then uh, nationally. And last but not least, we do do some work for the citizens of the state of Wisconsin when that uh, uh, is brought uh, to us. We have several facilities, uh, and one of them is on campus, and we currently have two facilities that are located off campus. The current laboratory is located at 465 Henry Mall, which is just sort of down the hill from Cal's. This is a building that was completed in 1953, and uh, uh, given the fact it's about 60 years old, uh, it's sort of coming towards the end of its useful life. We're maintaining this building until we can find uh, another suitable home. But this laboratory houses our Communicable Disease Division, the Disease Prevention Division, and then a Laboratory Improvement Division, which I'll describe. We have another very nice modern lab out on the east side of Madison over on a place called Agricultural Drive. If you're driving around the east side of Madison, there's a building that sits sort of on top of a hill all up there by itself. That's the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection's uh, main offices. Even though you can't see our lab, it sits down at the bottom of the hill on the west side. Uh, and in this facility, we have an environmental health division. We have a very robust occupational industrial hygiene laboratory. And then for some reason, we have the Forensic Toxicology Laboratory for the state of Wisconsin where we do drug and alcohol testing to support law enforcement and medical examiners and coroners throughout the state. But we're really quite excited because in the last two weeks, something has happened out at our site at Ag Drive. Uh, we've signed a contract to actually expand the laboratory. And within two weeks, there are a lot of Tonka toys arriving on site. You know, some of these things can move little boulders, but others can are, are now in the process of digging a hole to expand our laboratory uh, at this location. And you can see here the, the yellow area will be the expansion of the laboratory uh, and the other uh, part here, and I, <laughs> see I, had a, I thought I had a thing, one of these pockets. Uh, this, this part right here is the existing laboratory, this little L-shape, and then this is about an 80,000 square foot uh, addition to the laboratory that will be uh, shared between us and the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection. This gives you sort of an artist's rendering of what the building will look like uh, when it's completed uh, in June of 2013. This will greatly expand our, uh, our capabilities in terms of laboratory space and uh, about two-thirds of the laboratories that we have on campus will be moving out to this new, new facility at Agriculture Drive. Our communicable disease uh, uh, program, our laboratory improvement program, and then much of our operational support will, uh, will be moving into this new facility uh, when it's completed in a, a about uh, 18 months or so. Uh, now before I take you on this tour, of the lab, I wanted to show you this to kind of show you the, give you an idea of how the laboratory is actually organized. We've got a number of support functions up here, uh, uh, things like uh, human resources, quality assurance, IT, lab support, finance, public information, but the real workings of the lab are in these red, five red boxes at the bottom. We've got an environmental improvement division, uh, occupational health, communicable disease, environmental health, and then a disease prevention uh, division. And so what I'd like to do is kind of take you on a brief tour of those five divisions so you can have an idea of what we do in each one of those laboratories. Uh, I didn't mention that we also have to lease space. This is a place called Walton Commons, which is near the building on Ag Drive. We presently lease space in there for our IT operations, and much of the occupational uh, health surveillance activity that we do under a contract with, with OSHA. Okay, the first division is the Communicable Div Disease Division that Dr. Pete Schultz heads up. And in this particular division, that 
main categories of testing that they, they uh, provide include bacteriology, primarily public health bacteriology. Uh, they do epidemiology uh, in the sense that they have developed a number of technologies that allow them to make associations between maybe an organism that's, that uh, a person may be infected with and that same organism that may be from the environment or from a food or something like that. Uh, we have a hepatitis and HIV laboratory. Uh, the mycobacteria is the tuberculosis laboratory. Most of the work today with, uh, for tuberculosis is being referred to our laboratory. In the past, this was a very labor-intensive uh, 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 operation, but with newer technologies, what used to take six to eight weeks to perform, we can now do in about two hours. And so that whole, that whole uh, technology has changed over the last uh, five to seven years. We do some prenatal testing. We have a serology lab, virology, a bioterrorism preparedness lab. We're one of uh, one lab that has been able to bring online assays for pretty much all of the biological agents that we're concerned about uh, today. And then this division also has a robust uh, outreach where they network with clinical labs uh, throughout the state uh, for uh, laboratory reporting and then robust disease surveillance. The next is the disease prevention division and Dr. Curtis could probably describe this better and quicker than I can but let me take a shot at it. Uh, we have a cytology laboratory that uh, has a long history in the state lab of hygiene. Uh, it's been in, in effect over 50 years, and it's uh, a laboratory that primarily provides uh, cytology services to support publicly funded clinics uh, throughout the state. We're also a little unique because we house a school of cytotechnology. And cytotechnology, uh, we train uh, anywhere from five to 10 students a year in this school, and they come in and spend 12 months with us. Uh, but as some of that science seems to be changing, we're actually in the process of adding uh, molecular uh, pathology or molecular diagnosis component to what the, the cytotechnology students are uh, receiving. In addition, we have a newborn screening lab uh, that, that uh, actually test about 98 plus percent of all newborns in the state. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when I describe how we actually uh, contribute to public health here in the state of Wisconsin. We have a cytogenetics lab in this division, and then most recently uh, brought on a biochemical genetics lab that formerly was housed over at the Wiseman Center. Uh, the lab improvement division is, is uh, one of those areas of our lab where uh, my predecessor many years ago, Dr. Ron Lessig, realized that, that laboratories needed to perform proficiency testing in order to obtain their uh, accreditation. And so he saw that as an opportunity, an opportunity to put in place a service that we could provide at the laboratory and something that would actually make money for us. So this is a division that provides proficiency testing samples to other labs. It started out in Wisconsin, and we now send it to other states, and we actually have some international clients who uh, purchase these from the sa unknown samples from us. They test them and then report the results back to us, and the results get a reported to the accrediting uh, organizations uh, uh, in order to maintain their accreditation. So in addition to providing proficiency testing, we also have kind of an outreach in, and uh, uh, some training that goes on for environmental and clinical health, uh, uh, clinical uh, laboratory professionals that come out of this division. The next division is our occupational health division that Steve Strabel leads. Uh, Wool is not an 
I work something, an acronym to scare you. It stands for Wisconsin Occupational Health Laboratory. We are one of two laboratories in the country that have a $4 million a year contract from OSHA to provide industrial hygiene testing uh, to support uh, uh, consultations that they do throughout the country. Uh, we currently uh, perform testing on samples received from 42 states uh, when they're submitted to our laboratory. We've developed special capabilities for analyzing bioaerosols for things like uh, uh, fun uh, funguses, uh, spores in the air. We have an inorganic and organic chemistry lab to analyze samples collected in the workplace environment. And then we have another contract with OSHA that uh, funds occupational surveillance uh, and also provides staff who are available to work with private sector uh, employers throughout the state to provide health and safety consultation. And the last division we'll look at on this little tour is the Environmental Health Division that Jim Hurley leads. Uh, in this area we have a laboratories that perform environmental toxicology. They're actually testing environmental samples looking for either specific uh, uh, toxic agents in there or sort of general uh, toxicologic properties in, within some of these uh, uh, samples. We have an organic and inorganic chemistry lab. Much of their work supports the Department of Natural Resources. Our water microbiology lab, uh, uh, it get, performs samples for uh, some, a few people in the public will still send samples to us. Although if there are private labs that can uh, do that water testing, we often refer them to the, to the private uh, laboratories. We have a flow cytometry lab, which may seem a little different because most flow cytometry work is something that's been developed for use in a clinical lab. But in the environmental lab, we use that to actually count minute particles uh, that we find primarily in, in uh, uh, groundwater, surface water, uh, samples. Uh, we have a radiochemistry lab, a uh, virology lab that is uh, uh, actually looking at uh, surface water samples for viruses. And then we are one of 10 uh, laboratories in the country that are a, a chemterrorism level one laboratory, meaning the highest level of, of uh, preparedness. Uh, we actually have methods on online right now to analyze 30 plus of the more likely chemical uh, agents should, they, uh, should there be a need to do that. Uh, and then the last thing I'll just mention is the forensic toxicology uh, lab is also within this, this division. Okay. What I'd uh, like to do now is just talk a little bit about the contributions that this laboratory makes to sort of core public health uh, uh, in the state of Wisconsin. And I think the way to do that is just kind of highlight and give you some examples of how this laboratory uh, 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 contributes to public health. And then I'll wrap up by talking about the contributions to public health research. Here's one example. I mentioned just briefly a little earlier about the tuberculosis laboratory. State Laboratory of Hygiene uh, has brought online new technologies to support uh, clinical investigations uh, of tuberculosis throughout the state. Most of the laboratories in the past that used to culture for tuberculosis now will send those samples uh, uh, to our laboratory. Uh, we now use uh, nucleic acid uh, technologies that uh, are much quicker and provide much better uh, results than we had we could do uh, you know four or five years ago. We also have facilitated a, a statewide uh, network of these laboratories and have a training program that uh, uh, in, involves on-site uh, uh, meetings with these laboratories at least once a year. Another area where our lab contributes to public health is through the formation of something called the Wisconsin Cl 
clinical laboratory network. Uh, it's become real clear that in order to support public health the way it needs to be done, that we really, as a laboratory, we really need to network with other laboratories throughout the state. Uh, Pete Schultz and his staff have done a fantastic job identifying these other laboratories and engaging them in both a, uh, a training uh, opportunity and then also in a uh, network that allows them or encourages these laboratories to submit specimens to us whenever they think there may be uh, an outbreak or something going on. This network has been extremely valuable over the last four or five years uh, to help us identify outbreaks that are occurring throughout the state. Uh, without the network, it's possible the lab in Milwaukee might identify somebody with, say, salmonella, and then a lab in Wausau picks up a couple cases, and maybe a lab here in Madison. But through this network, we're able to have those samples come in and actually do some work that allows us to tie all of that together so that we can, these are not just isolated cases uh, and, and no opportunity to, to identify any, any common sources. Over the past three or four years, we've actually been on the leading edge of outbreaks that have involved multiple, uh, multiple states, not only here in the Midwest, but uh, outbreaks involving uh, uh, cases of, uh, of E. coli 0157 and salmonella in places like Florida, Arizona, Colorado. And with the network that we put in place here, these clinical labs are, are uh, encouraged and they do an excellent job of submitting these organisms to us so that we can do the further typing uh, that's necessary uh, with these outbreaks. This is just an example of uh, where the lab, laboratories and clinics are that are part of the network that we have developed here in the state of Wisconsin. We've got a different types. Uh, some of these are laboratories. Some of these are clinics or physician offices that act as sentinel sites for uh, respiratory disease surveillance. It was initially stood up to be an influenza surveillance uh, uh, network. Uh, but you can see over time we really have uh, pretty much the entire state covered by these laboratories that participate in our network. There's another network that our lab participates in that contributes to public health, and that's the Laboratory Response Network, which was stood up about 10 years ago by the FBI, by CDC, and by the Association of Public Health Laboratories. Uh, initially, this network was designed to provide standardized testing in all states for biologic agents. Uh, this came about after 9-11, uh, or right about the time of 9-11. The, the, uh, some of the labs were starting to come online, but with the 9-11 and then the anthrax attacks, it really emphasized the importance of having standard laboratories throughout the country that could respond to attacks like that. Uh, some of our staff have been in the forefront of leading uh, this effort and working with the federal uh, agencies in uh, further developing rapid methods that are used uh, in this laboratory. Another area that uh, uh, our lab supports uh, public health is uh, through a project that we refer to as the Food Corps Sentinel Site Project. We've received funding from CDC to basically enhance not just the laboratory capability, but the epidemiologic capability to respond to potential foodborne outbreaks. Uh, the idea is that, that we will develop the technology and the communication systems that will decrease the time it takes for us to recognize foodborne outbreaks and, and therefore improve the public health response uh, to those outbreaks. And as an example, uh, this summer in June, uh, we were notified by the Department of, or the Division of Public Health that there was a possible outbreak over in the eastern part, southeastern part of the state, uh, and that it involved uh, 
uh, students and family members who became ill following a Wisconsin Dairy Day event that was held on June 1st. Uh, as local health department looked into this, it became clear that uh, it seemed to be traced back to an event that occurred at a school where students were encouraged to bring Wisconsin products to school to share with their classmates. You know, some of the items that were brought to school included you know, cheese, sausage, ice cream, cake, milk, and someone thought it would be a great idea to bring unpasteurized milk and identified it as something being fresh from the cow. Well, this resulted uh, in uh, 18 identified cases of Campylobacter infection involving 13 households, uh, and uh, certainly the laboratory played a key role in, in uh, this particular investigation. All of the data really pointed back, of those people who became ill, pointed back to consumption of unpasteurized uh, milk. Uh, this is just more of the epidemiologic data uh, on that, and it was pretty clear that this was an outbreak involving uh, pasteurized uh, milk. Uh, there were nine uh, culture-confirmed cases, uh, and we were also able to uh, analyze samples that were uh, obtained from milk samples that were collected. The uh, Department of Ag, uh, Trade, and Consumer Protection went out, grabbed uh, raw milk samples, uh, cultured those. They identified Campylobacter in that. And like we do in so many of these types of investigations today, if we can get our hands on the actual organism that causes the outbreak, the organism that causes people to get sick, and then organisms from a food source, we've got the tools today to uh, to make a uh, uh, to be able to say whether those are really the same strain. You know, in the past we would simply identify an organism and well, but is it the same strain or not? Well, it, sometimes you could tell and sometimes you, you couldn't. But today, using tools like uh, PFGE or pulse field gel electrophoresis, we can actually look at the molecular level in those organisms and pretty well create a fingerprint, much like uh, you know, CSI does on, on other things, uh, so that we can say definitively whether the strain that was in the raw milk was the same strain that caused these individuals to be, get sick. And this has become a very, very powerful tool in the world of epidemiology, not only for looking at organisms like Campylobacter or Salmonella, but for a whole host of uh, infectious agents. Uh, this is just the last slide on this one, but basically what, it, what I've got here is a, a, uh, uh, a strips from a Pulsefeld gel electrophoresis pattern. And if you, when we do this, if we see the same, each one of these lanes is a different organism. And so it's pretty clear when you look at this that these three are pretty much the same as these three are pretty much the same as those three. And this is the kind of definitive evidence today that allows us to much more quickly and more definitively make associations for epidemiologic purposes and to support our mission in public health. I want to switch, yes? Well, I'm sure they're aware of this outbreak. Whether that makes any difference or not, who knows? Uh, let me just shift gears now and kind of talk about another public health program that the lab participates in. And I often refer to this as newborn screening is probably one of the most cost effective public health programs ever. Not only do we identify babies with conditions that can be, can be treated, but we can actually save babies' lives by doing newborn screening here in Wisconsin as well as elsewhere. Uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, well, first of all, this, do any of you, are any of you familiar with newborn screening? I mean, do I need to back up a little bit and kind of explain a little bit what this is? Let me just take a moment and do that. When a baby is born in Wisconsin, as well as any state in the U.S. today, a, uh, usually between the time they're 24 hours to 48 hours old, 
some mean person comes in and grabs the baby by the heel, squeezes their heel a couple times, and they prick it, and they collect about five drops of blood on a piece of filter paper. That filter paper then is sent into the lab, and when it arrives at the laboratory, we punch a very small circle out of that dried blood spot, and we test that for a whole host of conditions. It started out in the 1960s as a test for phenylketonuria, which is an amino acid, uh, uh, there's an enzyme defect in the metabolism of amino acids, and you would get a buildup of phenylalanine in the baby's blood, which led to some very severe permanent uh, uh, brain damage in these children. Uh, newborn screening from the 60s to today has advanced significantly uh, to where we can now test for, here in Wisconsin, we're screening for 44 diseases or abnormalities. There are other states that are now screening for over 50 uh, conditions. Uh, many of these conditions are things that, that uh, once a baby is diagnosed with this condition, there is a, uh, a therapy or there is a special diet that uh, can be provided to the child, and they can generally live a fairly normal life. Uh, but these are the conditions that we currently screen for uh, here in Wisconsin. The most recent one that we added was the, the third from the bottom on the far side there, known as severe combined immunodeficiency, which I'll mention, uh, I guess, right now. Uh, severe combined immunodeficiency is a really exciting uh, project that we've undertaken here in our laboratory and here in Wisconsin. This is a condition known as bubble boy disease. A baby is born without any functioning immune system. Uh, when they're late during the prenatal period, the uh, uh, premature uh, lymphocytes, the T cells, uh, uh, actually uh, mature to the point where they can produce an antibody uh, once the baby is born. If that does not happen, these infants often uh, are born without any way of fighting off an infectious disease. Uh, this happens uh, about 1 in 80,000 births. And so with some of the newer molecular technologies that have become available, we can actually screen blood taken on that little uh, spot a blood off of that filter paper, we can screen blood and look for a piece of DNA or the absence of the little piece of DNA that would indicate whether the baby has a functioning immune system or not. Uh, that technology was developed in large part right here in Madison by staff at our laboratory. And over the last three years, we have been able to convince the Department of Health and Human Services uh, and to convince NIH that this is something that should be uh, screened for in all babies born throughout the country. Uh, currently, there is a recommendation that all states bring this screening online. And as of today, California, Texas, Massachusetts, New York uh, have it online. And there's probably about 15 other states that will bring this screening online uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, basically what happens with this uh, is that the infants are born uh, and they'll have the maternal uh, antibody will give them some protection for about the first 60 days. But then these infants will develop recurrent uh, infectious diseases. Uh, and unless uh, there's an intervention, these infants will almost certainly die uh, within the first 18 months of life. Uh, we began screening all infants in the state of Wisconsin in January of 2008. And since that time, there has not, we, there's not been a case of severe combined immunodeficiency in Wisconsin that has been uh, not diagnosed at birth, uh, which is something we're really qu uh, quite proud of. Uh, this is a condition that once the child is identified with this, the child can undergo a stem cell transplant and actually be given the cells that will mature and produce a functioning immune system. 
So unlike uh, some of the conditions that we screen for in newborn screening, this is something that we can actually cure in an infant. And by the time they are given this transplant, this, the, the cells that are transplanted in graft and start multiplying and producing antibodies, we're basically curing an infant of this. It's sort of one of those first genetic cures that is really quite successful. Yes? Uh, they, they, they could, okay, because that's still a, uh, a genetic uh, marker. Uh, we know that it does run in families. We're currently studying some families in Wisconsin that have had multiple children uh, with this. Uh, so there's, uh, but it, I think it's, it's really exciting because based on some of the work we've done here that this is something that now is becoming the standard of practice, not only in Wisconsin but the U.S. And we've had contact with about 15 countries that are now eager to bring this type of screening on board as well. So we're working with them. Yes? Maple syrup urine disease is one, is one of those things that, uh, uh, and I believe we're still screening for that. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those uh, metabolic conditions that can be identified in an infant. Uh, and other than that, I can, I'm not sure I can say a whole lot more about that, but it was one of the early parameters that became part of newborn screening programs in all states but it is something that's you know, really quite, quite rare. Well, okay. What I was very interested in was reading about the years okay. before and uh, how we treat the youngest population. And uh, we get uh, very significant numbers of hits of that. We, um, after it's ID'd, we have to give rent another individual that's more metabolic and genetic than the person that we were able to eliminate in that study. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we do work for like uh, cytology, uh, and we have the school here. Basically, that supports public health by providing testing, uh, primarily Pap smears and tests for human papillomavirus that really are not available elsewhere because most of the work we do. Uh, are for clients who end up going to the public clinics throughout the state. Uh, our cytogenetic services, we have a full service clinical cytogenetics laboratory. Uh, in the past, this laboratory did little more than chromosome analysis, but on uh, bone marrow peripheral blood samples. But today, using some new technologies known as, as FISH or Array uh, CGH, uh, we're bringing online a whole host of molecular uh, testing. And this is an area where we have very active research and teaching activities undergoing as well. Mention occupational health, just another example. Uh, the surveys that we do here in Wisconsin, uh, uh, where we work with about uh, survey 6,000 employers a year to obtain information on occupational injury and illness. And then we publish these reports, uh, and uh, they are used then to, to uh, address interventions that may be appropriate in the various occupations that have high rates of injuries and illness. We also have a project where we look at all uh, fatal occupational injuries that occur in the state, and we're also working with uh, a workers' compensation to analyze the claims that are being uh, submitted. Okay. Uh, forensic tox, uh, we support public health in addressing one of Wisconsin's most horrific public health problems, and that is alcoholism and the effects that alcohol has on the people of this state. Uh, the uh, laboratory performs blood alcohol testing, and more and more we're moving into doing or performing uh, tests for uh, drugs, both the illegal drugs that people shouldn't have on board, but we now see more cases of impaired driving that result from people taking prescription drugs often at, at levels much higher than they have been prescribed. In addition to doing the test, we end up going to court, providing court testimony, 
and then working with the coroners and medical examiners on motor vehicle uh, deaths. That's auto uh, deaths involving uh, cars, boats, snowmobiles, motorcycles, and other vehicles. Okay, I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about public health research, the lab, and, and just kind of highlight or show you some of, the, some of the areas that we're involved in. The laboratory is a core laboratory that's part of the Institute of Clinical and Translational Research here at the University of Wisconsin. And at the present time, we're contributing to the establishment of a core uh, mass spectroscopy laboratory under the same program. And we're having some discussion about building a core molecular uh, diagnosis and genetics laboratory that would be a, a shared facility uh, here at the School of Medicine. Uh, each year, we publish an annual report that highlights the research activities and teaching and outreach activities of the laboratory. Uh, in our most recent annual report, we identified uh, a large number of partnerships that the laboratory staff maintain, uh, 88 peer review articles, 91 uh, papers have been presented at meetings both here in Wisconsin and outside. Uh, we have three funded fellowships that we support, and we had grant, 35 grants bringing in about $10.7 million. The details of all of this is found in this report, and the report is, is actually online as well. Uh, the next few slides uh, uh, highlight some of these research activities to give you an idea of the, where we are conducting research. In the Communicable Disease Division, we've got a number of projects looking at influenza. Uh, we're, we're looking for uh, resistance to antiviral agents among the influenza viruses that we identify here in the state and actually have a project where, where viruses being isolated uh, throughout the country are being sent to our lab and then to another lab in the U.S. so that we can monitor for uh, uh, susceptibility to antivirals. Uh, we have uh, uh, work going on at tuberculosis where we're continuing to develop methods amplification methods that will improve the, the turnaround time uh, in uh, identification of not only the organism that causes tuberculosis, but other acid-fast organisms as well. Uh, we've got uh, uh, some activity, research activity where we're continuing to build these laboratory networks. We have a very strong and robust clinical laboratory network but we're now in the process of building an environmental lab network to do many of the same types of things. Uh, Dr. Sharon Long uh, has uh, a successful research uh, project looking at developing microbial source tracking. This allows her to use a number of different types of tests to identify whether that E. coli is from a human source or from birds or from, or from animals. And this comes into play uh, in a number of these environmental outbreaks. Uh, some of the other areas of research, I mentioned uh, SCID. We're still doing some things there to improve that, uh, the methodology and to share that with others. Uh, we have a researcher who has spent his entire career working on Lyme disease and Lyme arthritis. Uh, we've got in the environmental uh, division uh, work that looks at trace metals and aquatic organisms in the Great Lakes. This is a multi-state collaboration uh, among the states ar around, the great, uh, around the Great Lakes. We're also applying uh, uh, molecular methods, specifically PCR, uh, in, in our environmental research. In the past, many of these technologies were developed from a clinical point of view, but now that we've got the equipment, the understanding of the technologies available, we're finding out that they can also be applied uh, in the environmental area. Uh, where we find many of these same organisms. The molecular diagnosis of genetic diseases is also uh, an active area of, uh, of research in our cytogenetics laboratory. In, in the, the recent past, we've evaluated new tests for a human papillomavirus and developed new assays for biological, chemical, and radiologic uh, methods. Uh, much of the research in this area involves participating on national groups that are working on developing standardized methods that can be shared among uh, all of the, the states. Uh, we've got two areas uh, that we're just moving into now. One is the uh, clinical application of stable uh, 
uh, metal isotopes. With some new equipment that we're in the process of obtaining, uh, we believe that there's a opportunity there for us to collaborate with another, a number of other researchers here on, on campus. Uh, we've done projects looking at urinary lead levels and breast cancer in uh, Wisconsin women uh, and have a study going of uh, vitamin D repletion and calcium absorption with other researchers here on campus. And I think my last slide of this is uh, just other areas. Uh, we're actively looking at respiratory viruses. You know, not only is this about influenza, it's about a whole host of respiratory viruses. Uh, and uh, what we are trying to figure out there is when people come in with symptoms of an influenza-like illness and it's not influenza, what is it? And we're, we're able to identify other respiratory viruses and to quantitate how often we see these types of things. Uh, other uh, research there involves uh, uh, looking at water for contamination with mercury, arsenic, and, and various types of toxins. Uh, and then recently we completed a project looking at blastomycosis here in the state of Wisconsin. So the State Lab of Hygiene is really on the front lines of protecting you and uh, our state's public uh, and environmental health by focusing in three areas, testing, teaching, and applied research. Uh, and if any of you have any interest in working with us or would like to see if some of the, tech, the work and technology that we have might augment what you're working on, I would certainly encourage you to get a hold of us and, and we'll do our best to, to be of help. With that, I'll stop and if you have any questions, I'll try to answer those.